Taranto, an ancient city on the Ionian Sea in the southern Italian region of Apulia. Taranto has been a vital commercial and military port since its founding in the 8th century BCE. Founded by Spartan colonists who were exiled sons of unmarried Spartan women. By 500 BCE, Taranto is one of the largest cities in the world with a population of 300,000. Taranto boasts of many famous citizens from a 4th century BCE philosopher Lysis of Tarentum to Hollywood director Quentin Tarantino, whose surname has its origins from the city. Although much is made of Rudolf Valentino's roots being in the nearby city of Castellaneta, his home from the time he was nine years old in 1904 until he left for America in 1913, was the city of Taranto. In 1910, Rudolph was 15 years old and living in the great city by the sea, which teemed with temptation. He was enticed and mesmerized by the music halls, the dancing venues, and above all, the signorine, or the ladies of the brothels. Prostitution in Taranto then was a thriving trade, as the numerous brothels catered to thousands of sailors coming and going in the busy port. Laws existed governing the brothels, with the legal age of admittance to a brothel being 18. But in general, the proof of age of a younger man was never checked, and the madams at the brothel's doors turned a blind eye. The teenager Rudolph's dallying in those brothels by the sea would ultimately affect his life, and drastically so. He would spend the remainder of his brief life of 31 years bearing a scar from those days in the brothels. It is a fact Rudolph Valentino suffered from syphilis, which he contracted from prostitutes in Taranto, a fact presented definitively by his family and by himself as he detailed his predicament in letters which still exist today. Yet the very mention of his condition inevitably sparks a firestorm of emotions. It is still an inherently controversial aspect of the life of the much idolized icon Rudolf Valentino, and his passionate following is vehemently and deeply divided on the subject. In this episode, we carry the narrative forward and broaden the discussion of just how this disease affected Rudolf Valentino's life, and we will address specifically how it impacted his military involvement in Italy, which resulted in his status as deserter from the Italian army. Despite the centuries-long history of social stigma associated with the very subject of syphilis, I feel the impact of this disease on so many aspects of Valentino's history now makes the issue impossible to ignore. As illuminated by new revelations, newly found documentation, and intrepid research, today we respectfully ask, was Rudolf Valentino blind in his left eye? Was he declared a deserter from the Italian army? And how were these two misfortunes connected this and much more in this episode, we title, Rudolph Valentino, That Left Eye, and more. Ciao, I am Renato Flores, the very proud publisher of all the scholarly and entertaining books on Rudolf Valentino and Natasha Rambova by Evelyn Zumaya. I'm here today with Evelyn to discuss more about her fascinating work. Ciao, Evelyn. Ciao, Renato. Uh, it's great to be here on this snowy evening. Uh, as I just explained, we set this discussion down in the southern Italian city of Taranto a busy port thriving economically, as tens of thousands of sailors spent their earnings in the local shops, marketplaces, and brothels. In this lively city, the notoriously errant and devil-may-care teenage boy Rudolfo Guglielmi lived his life. With the well-known stories about this time in his life too numerous to mention here, I think every biography of Valentino covers some of his teenage escapades in Taranto. But I think the most compelling insight 
into this time in his life was written by Valentino himself in 1910 at 15 years of age. He writes his friend Bruno Pozzan on August 29th, 1910. And I cite your translation of that letter. And I quote, Not long ago, a 17-year-old cabaret singer was in Taranto, and I had a great time with her. Then, while I am courting cabaret singers, I make love with prostitutes, leaving one to take another. End quote. In another letter to Bruno, Rudolph writes, and I quote, I am at home sick now with an illness I caught from some prostitutes, end quote. I cite that second letter from the Ph.D. dissertation of Valentino's great-grandniece and Valentino family spokesperson Janine Villalobos. Her revelations on this subject stand as definitive word. She comments how Rudolph, and I quote, exhibits very little shame about the illness, end quote. And she sets the disease within the historical context of Italian culture at the time, where she says, and I quote, contracting a venereal disease was a sign of masculinity, end quote. And she refers to Rudolph's being, quote, symptomatic intermittently throughout his life. She elaborates how the illness was of great concern to his mother and relates how Valentino discusses with the family news about various medications and cures. Now, with this definitive study from Ms. Villalobos, we are able to state as fact Rudolph Valentino contracted syphilis as a teenager from the prostitutes in Taranto, and also state as fact this syphilis manifested as ocular syphilis, leaving him eventually blind in his left eye. Uh, Renato, I learned more about this in reading a medical paper on the subject, and I cite the article titled Recognizing Ocular Syphilis from the website retina.com backslash articles May June 2018 where it is explained that ocular syphilis is not an uncommon complication of syphilis. 27% of those who contract the disease will have it affect their eyesight. Uh, it is also a point to be made that although the disease rendered Valentino blind in his left eye, he was often in remission. As Ms. Villalobos wrote, quote, he was symptomatic intermittently. This made it possible for Valentino to hide this condition, but this did not lessen the suffering for him nor his quest to find treatment and a cure. Because then syphilis had no cure and would not until 1943 with the advent of penicillin. The best someone could hope for then was to try and keep the disease in remission. And I get the definite impression that pre-1943, People suffering from syphilis faced a constant monitoring and some form of treatment. I think the reason Valentino kept this hidden was obvious. Uh, even today, the social stigma about this disease is heavy. It is perceived as a disease which was a punishment for sin, the sin of promiscuity. It isn't surprising this was not made publicly known or widely known until the Villalobos dissertation. And... When did you first learn about this? Renato, I first learned about this in 2003, while I was researching my Valentino biography, Affairs Valentino. I was then conducting interviews with Valentino memorabilia collector William Bill Self in his home in Bel Air, California. It was Bill Self who told me that Rudolph Valentino's brother Alberto once told him personally his brother Rudolph contracted syphilis from prostitutes in Taranto as a teenager. That was the extent of Self's revelation. Now, I'm able to say in hindsight, I was tentative in broaching this subject back then, and in some ways I still am. But at the time, I had a MySpace page dedicated to my book, Affairs Valentino, and it was there I posted a short comment wondering if perhaps Valentino's notoriously poor eyesight had anything to do with his having syphilis. I cited the medical condition referred to as the ocular manifestations of syphilis, and then left the subject at that. In 2011, I included Bill Self's mention in Affairs Valentino, but only as an endnote. But a lot has happened in regard to this subject since then. A great deal. 
I think this subject is still suppressed for many reasons. It has been, Renato. I think the subject of Valentino's contracting syphilis is something that is not mentioned, not only because of the social shame and stigma, but because it is a critical piece of proof of his sexual orientation. And in this, I feel there is a point to be made. I mention this because I feel strongly against the censorship of key elements of Valentino's true history by those who portray Valentino as a closeted gay man. I think by now we know this was not his truth. Certainly Valentino's letters to his friend Bruno Pozzan are valuable historically in this regard. Ms. Villalobos felt the 15-year-old Valentino's letters to his friend Bruno historically so valuable she cited them in her Ph.D. dissertation. So, as you know, Renata, I was recently blown away to learn that one of these precious letters to Bruno was sold by a known Valentino memorabilia collector, and in my opinion, it was sold on purpose to suppress, if not destroy, the contents. In my opinion, this letter, which we cited earlier, was flung into oblivion. It was only by chance I learned about this letter. When a follower of mine on the Affairs Valentino Instagram account notified me they purchased some letter written by Valentino. They were curious what it said, had no idea of its historical importance or history, uh, and asked if you, Renato, would translate the letter. Now, I understand these valuable pieces of Valentino history will never realistically be housed in one museum archive available to researchers, but still they should be. It was only, only because this person contacted me on social media that we were able to share the contents of that revealing and important letter. And I allege, yes, the Valentino Historical Archive is and was censored, and this piece was tossed into oblivion. How severe a case of syphilis do you think Valentino had? Considering the fact he suffered primarily symptoms of ocular syphilis, he might not have manifested symptoms systemically, externally, I think, but the medications available at the time were primitive and toxic. They consisted of metal-based compounds of arsenic and mercury, both highly poisonous. The arsenic compound salversan was the foremost medication used then, followed by neosalversan, which was something Valentino was taking, according to Ms. Villalobos. Another treatment which was widely accepted was the theory that sweating and even a fever lessened the outbreaks and the severity of symptoms. The use of hypothermic cabinets or sweat boxes was used, and I wonder if Valentino's almost obsessive physical working out was a form of self-treatment used to keep the disease in remission. Did his sweating and working up a sweat lessen and suppress the effects of the syphilis? It makes you appreciate how well he kept this disease in remission and stayed healthy. Yes, it really sheds new light on the strength of Rudolf Valentino, both physically and psychologically, especially realizing uh, that another manifestation or symptom specifically of ocular syphilis is photophobia, an acute sensitivity to light. Imagine Valentino on a movie set in those days with the intensely bright Klieg lights. It must have been excruciating. Was his squardo, his infamous glance with those piercing eyes, a result of his effort to just power through the pain of photophobia? And I wonder, was this a sort of grin and bear it device he used to not wince? I posed that question long ago in my MySpace post. And I think I was not so far off the mark. It must have been impossible for him to drive well. And this is probably the reason for all of his car accidents. I found Valentino at the driver's license from New York. The state of New York issued the first driver's license in 1910. Mm -hmm. But there was no medical examination or either sight, hearing, or reflex. So, even a deaf and blind person could obtain a driver license. I think every biography on Valentino addresses the subject of his poor eyesight, whether it concerned his driving, 
or whether it was it was expressed through the accounts of his co-stars and friends. And I also want to comment how his trusted business manager and closest friend, S. George Allman, could have gone deep here on this subject in his 1975 memoir, but he did not. None of this was revealed until it was presented by the Valentino family. And although Ms. Villalobos writes, and I quote, it is likely that Rudolfo Syphilis excluded him from service, end quote, uh, I now concur. It is likely the syphilis could have been a cause for exemption from the military, as it was the second most common reason for disability in World War I, second only to the influenza epidemic of 1918-1919. Now this said, according to new documents discovered in local Italian archives by Professor Aurelio Micoli, we can state as fact that the left eye blindness was the official determining factor in his military involvement in Italy. The story of Valentino's conscription history as being drafted into the Italian army is a fascinating one and now told as documented by Professor Micoli with his discovery of Valentino's official record on file in the State Archive of the Province of Lecce. Professor Mikuli includes this new information in his new book just published, titled Valentino and the Professor. Aurelio Mikuli does not delve into the cause of the poor eyesight nor the subject of syphilis, but instead documents the history of Valentino's call to bear arms in Italy. Well, which goes like this. Uh, by 1914, Professor Micoli enlightens us, so many Italians had expatriated that their returning to Italy for a military draft became impractical. Every four or five years, the government would declare an amnesty for the crime of desertion. Now, draft notices were always delivered to the emigrants by the Italian consulates, and the Italian-American press encouraged emigrants to return to Italy. This was considered the honorable course to take when you were drafted. Now, this situation presented substantial hardship for the Italians living outside of Italy. Based on the translation of this document, the chronology of Valentino's experience in this regard was as follows. Before leaving for America in December of 1913, Valentino submitted a self-declaration of good health and readiness to be drafted when he turned 19 years of age the following year. He was required to do so in order to secure a passport. Valentino was drafted on December 30th, 1914 at 19 years old. But because he was in the U.S., his date of summons was postponed until December 1st, 1915. He was then classified as what we used to call 1A, a first and optimal category, ready and able to fight. Now, because Valentino did not show up for that draft call, he was declared a deserter on December 6, 1915, with this being filed with the Military Court of Bari on December 31st, 1915. So between December 1915 and the spring of 1917, Valentino was awarded the status of deserter. At that time, 100 people in Valentino's district were also declared deserters. When the U.S. entered the war in the spring of 1917, Valentino sought to enlist in the U.S. military, as this was a way to satisfy the requirement. His mother encouraged him not to join the Air Force, and as we know, he was refused because of his poor eyesight. After being refused in U.S. and Canadian Air Forces, this information was relayed to the Taranto Conscription Office. They issued a formal notice of exemption for Rudolfo Guglielmi in 1917, but this order was rejected by the governing body, the Military Court of Body which denied the lower office order. For this reason, Valentino then turned himself in to the Italian consulate in Los Angeles on May 29, 1918. 
for his physical exam, and it was then he initiated the process of permanent exemption. And it was then it was recorded he was totally blind in his left eye. It is worth commenting on the situation Valentino faced, because this was still unresolved when he returned to Italy in 1923. Uh, it was unresolved. And an important event took place for Valentino when the Italian government declared an amnesty for deserters in September of 1919. And with this, he no doubt felt safe to return. But in fact, his paperwork processing this was so bogged down in Italian bureaucracy, he would not be fully discharged as a deserter until March of 1925. I think he did not push this through the process until it became critical for him when he applied for U.S. citizenship in 1925. I cite the reason for his permanent exemption from the document, and I quote, Rejected following a revision for complete blindness of the left eye by determination of the management of the military hospital of Bari, March 5, 1925. End quote. And you, Renato, found evidence the subject of his being a deserter was current news even when he died. This when you found an interview given by Valentino's sister-in-law, Ada, a few days after his death in 1926, in which she addresses the subject of Valentino being a deserter from the Italian military. And I cite the article which appeared in the Turin newspaper La Stampa on August 27, 1926, and I quote, and here the lady recalls another complaint against Valentino, that of not having returned to Italy for the war and being labeled a deserter. No desertions, she says. Rudolfo Guglielmi was, while in America, repeatedly subjected to health examinations by the Italian authorities and exonerated for health reasons, end quote. This also shed a new light on the anger against him in Italy, when he applied for U.S. citizenship, which was inspired by Mussolini. On Valentino's conscription record, which we have been citing, this is evident. There are a few years of fascist insults scrawled on the form, dating up until 1938, uh, such as the mocking of his name as Valentini, ineligible, requiem, alias aka king of the artists. And I know you, Renato, have insight to share on one other military rejection of Rudolf Valentino, and this by the Italian Navy. I believe, and this is my personal hypothesis, that Rodolfo was not accepted at the Morosini Naval Academy in Venice not because of any chess measurement deficiency. Uh, yes, as you found, uh, those physical parameters, which were regulated by strict rules, with the standard of measurement set by the measurements of the supreme head of the royal army, King Vittorio Emanuele III. Now, his height was only five feet, and consequently he was not equipped with a, a mighty chest. And I know you told me of a personal testimony, as a high school friend of yours once said their grandfather was forced to go to war in 1915 because he was one inch taller than the king. Now, that excuse of chest measurement insufficiently does not really stand up, and we believe Rudolfo was rejected not only because of his lack of vision acuity, but because he had a positive Wasserman test for syphilis. I think in knowing Valentino was totally blind in his left eye, it is noticeable, especially in those intense poses from the sheik, the first sheik. I'm not sure how he circumvented the issues of the blindness in that eye and the physical exams required for those insurance policies taken out on him by the studios. And there are other considerations involving his love life, his desire for children, this all presents issues. As Alberto Valentino said in one interview, his brother Rudolf wanted many children and a large family. Valentino certainly knew when he was in remission and not contagious, 
and as he was being photographed constantly and not manifesting visibly outward symptoms of the disease, he seems to have successfully kept it under control. I do think he was quite heroically managing the condition, and for this reason, staying in great shape physically. Now, in regards to the question of whether this was why his first wife, Jean Acker, never slept with him, I cite George Ullman's 1975 memoir, page 40, for the account of that, and I quote, Shortly after Rudy completed the very successful Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, Jean Acker, his wife, sued him for separate maintenance. She charged that he had deserted her, had refused to live with her, and refused to support her. She asked for $300 a week for herself and a $1,500 fee for her attorney. Jean had met Rudy before he became important to Hollywood, and she simply set out to snare the young and rather unsophisticated actor into marriage. The truth about their separation after three days of marriage is that she had a physical problem which prohibited her from having sex relations, and it was for this reason that they agreed to part, end quote. And yes, I made the mention in Affairs Valentino about Allman frantically trying to secure the mercury-based medication Medifen during Valentino's final hours. I wrote this in as an antiseptic medication. I would not change that in light of what I know and say I think this could be evidence the shock of the surgery and illness instigated an outbreak of the syphilis. Do I think this could have contributed to his death? Yes, I certainly do. You know, many famous people notoriously suffered from syphilis. Valentino was not alone in this. Not at all. Uh, yes, Renato, the list is long. It is alleged Shakespeare's baldness was the result of his toxic treatments for syphilis. And the list includes Nietzsche, Al Capone, the artist Edouard Manet, Franz Schubert, and even Valentino's first host and generous benefactor in New York in 1913, Ernesto Filomardino. Ernesto Filomardino would die at 50 years of age on March 11, 1921. And on his death certificate, the cause of death is cited, and I quote, general paralysis, tabetic type, contributory syphilis, end quote. Apart from any moral judgment or prejudice, I consider Rudolf Valentino a real hero. Yes, a hero, because he was able to overcome his handicap, because certainly his condition is to be considered a real handicap. He was able to act in his movies in the finest way. First of all, by keeping his condition secret and then by having managed to hide his limited vision. Last but not least, it is to be appreciated all that George Ullman did to keep Rodolfo's illness hidden. Since I learned of his physical condition, my esteem for him has grown, and I invite everyone to support this belief. As more of Valentino's true story is revealed through these documents and family testimony, his life appears to have been a perilous tightrope walk over some great chasm of serious problems, snapping beasts, if you will, all attempting to instigate his final fall. And in some ways, this did occur. Those snapping beasts, his deserter status back in his homeland, the constant vigilance to his physical condition. And then there were the cries of effeminacy, the xenophobic outrage, the protests of his immoral effect on teenagers, and even a dictator in Italy inciting riots against him. It's a long list. And I will add to that list of snapping beasts, those who today in their wild projection contort his history into fictional madness and bully for control of their false narrative. But Renato, I have to ask in closing, is Rudolph Valentino not even more of a superhero in that he achieved all he did despite these obstacles he faced? I think so. I'm going to close by reading a synopsis, an extract, if you will, which was found in Valentino's file in the State Archive of the Province of Lecce, and as translated by you, Renato. And I quote, On May 6th, 
1895, Rudolfo Pietro Filiberto Raffaello Guglielmi was born in Castellaneta, a city at the time of the province of Terra do Tranto, with its capital being Lecce. He was better known by his stage name of Rudolfo Valentino, a true icon of silent cinema and undisputed star in Hollywood. The young Rudy, before embarking on his dazzling artistic career, which would result in his reaping laurels in the mecca of U.S. cinema, fulfilled the obligation of a medical examination at the military district of Taranto and was enrolled in the draft of his class of birth in the first category, which classified him as being ready and able to be sent to arms. This document on file summarizes his personal details, some personal, anthropometric, and personal data. Guglielmi, Rudolfo, agronomist, one meter and 75 centimeters tall, son of Giovanni and Maria Barbino, obviously capable of reading and writing. In reality, his mother was Maria Barbin, being of French origin, but the Italianization of foreign names and surnames was not uncommon. From a wealthy family, and after the untimely death of his father, a veterinarian, the young Rudolfo emigrated abroad before the initiation of the military draft of his birth class. After the outbreak of the war, he was called to arms on December 1, 1915, but he did not answer the call, residing in the United States since the end of 1913, according to what is reported in his biographies. He was then therefore declared a deserter on December 6, 1915, like many Italians who emigrated abroad who did not respond to the appeal. His failure to present himself was reported to the military court of Bari on December 31, 1915. He would surrender himself to the Royal Italian Consulate in Los Angeles on May 29, 1918. Once the war ended, he benefited from the amnesty granted for military crimes on September 2, 1919, and by February 18, 1925, and by order of the investigating officer of the military court of Bari, no criminal proceedings were initiated against him. In the same year, he was ruled exempt by reason of blindness in one eye following a decision by the management of the military court of Bari on March 5, 1925. At that time, in fact, he had applied for American citizenship for work reasons, and to obtain this, a document of suitability for military service was required. But it was prevented by the title of deserter, with which he had been stamped in Italy. He therefore preferred to obtain a declaration of physical ineligibility for the service. His personal story, through the meager data provided by the matriculation registry and some biographical notation, helps to make sense of the sequence of dates and measures mentioned. The story of Valentino's desertion deserves a broader reflection, which signals a phenomenon that is anything but marginal in the context of the Great War. The deserters in many cases were Italians who emigrated abroad for work before their call to arms. In the registry which reports Valentino's conscription record, more than 100 young people of his birth class are also declared deserters because they did not comply with military obligations after having expatriated. Some in the United States, especially in New York, but also in Boston, Pittsburgh, San Jose, and Chicago. Some in Canada, Toronto, some in Argentina, Buenos Aires. Some of them came from municipalities in the Taranto district, others from municipalities in Basilicata, located in the Matera district, which in regards to the draft was headed by the military district of Taranto, signed by Maria Rosaria Tamble, end quote. The handsome teenager Rudolfo, without a doubt, made an impression on the madams working those doors of Taranto's brothels. And I am sure he had no problem gaining access and was a very welcome customer. I think because of Rudolfo's physical beauty, he was fairly doomed to succumb to the lure of those madams flirting with him. Italy's history of and culture of prostitution, uh, as you know, Renato, is something difficult for me to accept. When I first came to Italy, it was shocking for me to see prostitutes in 2011 sitting on a folding chair alone out in a field with their purse on their lap holding a cell phone, sometimes in the middle of winter. 
And in preparing this episode, I realized after my own experience just how different the Italian culture is in this regard. Valentino grew up in a city where the main tourist attractions were the brothels, a city which was founded by the Spartan sons of unmarried women. Imagine that as your city's economy and heritage. Yikes. Uh, so I think it unfair, unreasonable to judge this issue from a vantage point of American culture, which in my opinion is so dominated by moral judgment. Men of all kinds used to go to those brothels, military officers, husbands, boys for their first experience, and the curious, uh, who loitered outside never entering the brothel or investing a penny. Uh, come on in, either give us the business, boys, or get out of the way. The madams were reported to have called to those loitering. But Rudolfo did not loiter and gave them business. And as Ms. Villalobos comments, Rudolfo exhibited no shame about the illness he contracted in doing so. So with this the case, I think we should not be shameful about it either. So be it. And Professor Saurelio Micoli's new book, titled Valentino e il Professore, Quello che so di Valentino, published by Scorpione Editore, is now available online. Uh, yes, and I want to emphasize in closing my attributions to Ms. Villalobos and Professor Micoli and express gratitude for their definitive documentation on this aspect of Valentino's life. And I want to emphatically state that these military conscription documents were discovered by Aurelio Micoli, and he should be accredited in each and every instance of their reference. And for me, before closing, I want to say my wish for this new born year. Collaboration, not competition, in the world of Valentino. And as the usual, fiat justitia, ruat celum. And for the good, good guys, arrivederci. <laughs>